to work tomorrow. So I'm here tonight. So um, I, I guess maybe I should say that uh, we we uh, maybe I'll pretend that we actually called each other and planned to say something similar in a way. Um, I heard earlier something about how you know kids may not realize all the job possibilities that there are out there. And that's something that, um, I guess in a sense, is really the theme of what I want to talk about tonight. And that is sort of the process of discovery in more ways than one. And one of those ways is, is as you mentioned earlier, when I was growing up, I had no idea, and I, I, I'm still amazed, I had no idea that the kind of jobs that I do were even available. And even if I knew that they were available, I never in a million years would have thought that that would be me, that I'd somehow find myself where I am today. And so I think there's a real lesson in this for, <clears throat> for all of our young people that, it, I, I guess it's been said many times, the world is your oyster. And it really is. Um, so, I came from really very humble beginnings. I'll have to tell you about the title of the book I'm going to write someday about mm -hmm. growing up. Uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, a very shy kid, uh, and I think uh, maybe that was part of it, maybe that was part of what drove me in the direction that, that, that I did. I grew up in rural Georgia, um, truly middle of nowhere. Our little plot of land was 100 acres, the, it was the smallest one by far around, and bordering us on the other side of our dirt road and wooden bridges over the creeks was the um, Oconee National Forest. So miles and miles and miles of natural area, and for you know a kid who wasn't terribly outgoing, I could come home from school and instead of doing homework, I can tell you guys now, I didn't tell myself <laughs> that. Instead of doing homework, I just disappeared in the woods. Um, I had a great time. I just knew that as long as I was home by dinner time, even if that was after dark, my parents didn't worry too much. So anyway, um, I, I thought what I'd do today is tell you. <clears throat> A little bit about how I got where I am, and maybe that can perhaps serve as a model. I'm sure we all have interesting stories to tell our students. Um, but along the way, I thought I'd also tell you a little bit about some of the science that I do today, because again, it's it's something that I never would have imagined. It's a really fun thing. So um, let's see. This is actually a, a photo that my son made about a year ago of one of our research animals. It's a wonderful animal. This is called a rhinoceros viper. It's from Africa. I would have brought a couple for you to see tonight. Um, but actually, <clears throat> let me get a, a visual aid for you in case you haven't seen it already. This is not a rhinoceros viper, but you've got to be very careful. Don't look into its eyes. <laughs> All right? I'm very, very brave. Oh, it's looking into my eyes. <laughs> So I want, to, I want you guys, well, I'm taking it out just to get people excited. Oh, by the way, if you got here early, you might have noticed there were two in there. So <laughs> if you see the other one, let me know. Uh, this is actually a, a green tree python. It's from Southeast Asia. And <clears throat> that snake and this snake are actually quite different in one very interesting way. This snake has this array of holes around the front of its face, and they're called pet organs. And they're actually the single best infrared sensor of any kind on the face of this planet, natural or artificial. So another interesting tie-in, the military industry are actually very interested in how these animals operate. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more about why this is so special. So let's see. How about right here? So maybe there will be two running around out there. <laughs> he usually stays like that. He's nocturnal, so... Don't dim the lights too much or he'll disappear. <laughs> Alright, so a little bit about what we do in my lab, what, what we do today. Um, oh, the reason I put in that, that picture, that previous image, is because this is how I grew up. Um, living out there in the middle of nowhere, I had two brothers, one a year older, one a year younger. My older brother was really interested in electronics. He was building radios and things like that when he was a kid, anything engineering and Electricity, electronics, uh, mechanical, that sort of thing. My little brother was really interested in impressing people. So, you know, that was his big talent. The, the, the speaking and the engaging other people, that was what he did. So, I was the, the oddball. Um, I loved animals. 
I, when I was really young, snakes were the only animal, snakes and spiders were the only two things that I was really afraid of. And I, I literally remember the day when I got over it. Um, I can tell you the story, but the short of it is, um, one day I literally just realized in an instant, you know, why am I afraid of these animals and, you know, I love all the others. So, um, to my mother's dismay, and really my dad's too, I changed and I fell in love with these animals and pretty soon they were in our house and they were escaping <laughs> in our house. And so, it made for a colorful childhood. Um, but in addition to snakes, you know, we had all sorts of farm animals. Uh, I had pet uh, raccoons and possums and flying squirrels. I had a pet deer who, when she was a fawn, slept in my bed. She curled up next to me at night like a dog or a cat. So, really a, a fascinating way to grow up. I did fall in love with these snakes. I became fascinated with them. And the short of it is, um, I never imagined I could make a living doing something like that. I kind of thought maybe I'd be a farmer. That's what I knew. That's what I grew up around. And then I thought, you know, maybe I, I really like these animals so much. I'm going to college. I don't know what I'm going to study, but I'll go to college because all my friends are going to college. I literally took the SAT because my friends were taking the SAT. <laughs> so, so I, you know, it, it, it just sort of happened in a way. Well, I got to college, and where I went, you didn't declare a major before you got there, but within the first week, they were asking you, you know, what is your major, what is your major? And I was in a panic, and I'm looking at this long list. I'm looking at English and history. Um, and I don't know if it was literally there or overnight that night or something, but it finally, it was one of those duh moments. You know, I've been a biologist my whole life. You know, what else is there? So that got things started. I thought maybe I would go into, I don't know, forestry or some sort of environmental something where I could be working outdoors. That's what I love. Um, anyway, I'll tell you a bit more about the, the, you know, how this came to pass and how I ended up here a little later. But the short of it is, at some point during my academic training, I sort of fell back into, I never stopped keeping snakes. We used to have them hidden in our apartment. Where it was illegal to have them. But, uh, but anyway, I never stopped keeping them, never stopped being fascinated by reptiles. But at some point in my career, I was able to convince um, the Air Force, actually, to fund my laboratory to the tune of some one and a half million dollars. They were literally calling me, asking me to spend more money every now and then. It was a nice position to be in, to study snakes. Because I had told them about this amazing um, thermosensor, infrared sensor, the ability of these animals to look out and see the world in heat. Not just in light, but in heat. And they were sold, and, and you know things really, really went well. And I was able to finally tell my mom that you know, hey, look at this! I actually get paid to play with snakes. So <laughs> she was absolutely amazed. So a little bit about what we do with these animals. Uh -oh, no so um, you know the electromagnetic spectrum. I know we're not all physics teachers in here, but visible light. <coughs> from about 400 to 700 nanometers. <clears throat> Why do we call this visible light? Because we can see it. Somebody said, and I heard that emphasis, we can see it. But this is a little artificial because it's not what animals can see. Some animals can see further into the UV than we can. Some can see further into the IR than we can. So infrared is that region of the electromagnetic spectrum just beyond red. Ultraviolet is that region just beyond, um, beyond violet. And I like to think of the visible part of the spectrum as sort of a, an optimal balance between something that we can detect with the biochemistry in our eyes, but yet not, uh, it's got enough energy that we can detect it, but it doesn't have, these photons don't have so much energy that it's damaging. We wear sunscreen for a reason to protect against the damaging effect of high energy ultraviolet photons. So visible light is this nice balance. All animals see with their eyes roughly in that range, around 400 to 700, a little less, a little more, depending on the species. There are a few animals that can see somewhat farther out into the infrared. There's a species of very deep sea shrimp. They live along these hydrothermal vents, um, you know, at the mid-Atlantic Ridge and elsewhere around the world. And they actually detect the heat coming off of those, um, those black smokers, as they call them, the vents under the ocean. Very, very hot. They want to be close enough that they don't freeze, but not so close that they wind up being boiled shrimp. So, that's, that's how we all work. A few animals a little further into the infrared. These snakes are very different. That Burmese python on the bottom, this is that creature, uh -oh, 
have laser pointer, but, but that Burmese python on the bottom, that's an albino of the snake that you always hear about on the news that's loose in South Florida. The, the two little, well, you can see one. Well, you see his eyes. His eyes are obvious. That's his nostril. These things are the heat sensors. Those are the pit organs. And they operate way out in the infrared, much farther than any other living thing detects. So instead of, say, 700, 800, maybe even 900 nanometers, this is way out at about 10,000 nanometers. So they're detecting very cool objects, things like us. Um, and we know that there are devices that can do this. We developed a variety of kinds of devices. This is one here, a Raytag infrared thermometer. Oh, I can use this for my laser pointer. Um, so, um, you know, I can measure the temperature of my hand remotely. It says, um, I got it on Fahrenheit, 83 degrees. Cool hands, Ooh, warm heart. Right? So we've got infrared detectors, we've got thermosensors that work very well. Um, but still, in that image of that house, you see these in an Owens Corning fiberglass commercial. Um, they, can, they can form images, but still, nothing does it like these snakes do. They use microscopic sensors, they have these arrays of cells within those pit organs that detect this, this uh, radiant energy, these infrared photons coming off of objects like you and me in the chair, the floor, and the walls. And they put it together to form a detailed image of the thermal environment. Um, they, can, uh, they can adapt to new conditions if the background is warmer or the background is cooler, just like your eyes can adapt to a brighter room or a dimmer room. Um, they can repair themselves. They can repair themselves if something goes wrong. So really an amazing system. Plus, the sensitivity is at least purported to be perhaps 10 times better than the best artificial infrared sensor. So they really, really are good systems. Um, now, the diagram in the lower right um, shows us uh, sort of a, a diagrammatic view of a snake's head, and you can see the eye here, and we know how light comes into the eye, and it is projected onto the back of the eye onto the retina, and that information is sent into the brain, in a snake's brain, to a region called the optic tectum, in a spatially conserved manner. And what that means is there is literally a map of the retina in that snake's brain. There's a map of your retina in your brain. If you look around the world, this world is literally projected in a spatially conserved fashion in your visual cortex. The cool thing is the pit organ operates much the same way. There's an array of sensors in the back of that, that little hole in their face. Both the eye and this pit organ are sort of like a pinhole camera. And it's collecting information about the thermal environment and sending that information, we believe, uh, based on some previous studies of anatomy of the brain, we believe that it sends it back to the brain through a different pathway, but ultimately it ends up in the optic tectum too, so that these snakes are literally seeing the world in two different parts of the spectrum at the same time. They're seeing invisible light and they're seeing heat. And these two images merge into a single image in the brain. Does anybody remember the movie Predator? That's these guys. This is where they got the inspiration. Either that or they made it up and they were very really lucky that it's <laughs> exactly this. So, one little piece of data. I'm going to tell you three short stories that I put together for a talk a couple of weeks ago and I thought it would play very well here. So, one little piece of data. I said that we think we know the pathway that this information utilizes to go in the brain. Remember I said something about discovery? <clears throat> that process of discovery, discovering who we are, but also scientific discovery. This is one of the coolest things, and I don't want to forget to say this. Um, I know that no one in this room teaches this way, but I can tell you that when I grew up, I, I just devoured anything about science, especially anything in the life sciences. I read every book in the field that our library had over and over and over again. Um, I love class, I love doing anything in class, I love learning everything that I could in class, but I really came out of high school with the impression that what science is, or the study of science anyway, is the process of reading a bunch of stuff, listening to teachers, and just cramming all this information into my head about all the things in the world that we know, because we know everything. And it wasn't until, honestly, I don't think it was until grad school, that I finally came to realize 
that, as we all know, of course, what science really is, is that process of discovery. Because the things we don't know, and how we go about finding those things. And to me, uh, to me, that's one of the things that I think is most important to instill in children. Again, I'm sure that we all do that now. I, I hope we do. I'm sure we do. So this was one of those. You know, I, had, I grew up knowing a little bit about this system, and I assumed that everybody knew how it worked, and it turns out that we know almost nothing about it. So that pathway, we've been working on a variety of aspects of this, but this pathway of information flow in the brain was one of the things that, there have been some reports, but very, very few, there are tens of thousands of papers on vision every year published. There might be 30 or 40 papers total published on this infrared system in snakes in all of history. So there's a lot to be learned. So we were interested in that pathway, how the information gets from the pit organ to this optic tectum, if it really does. You know, we wanted to confirm and maybe extend what people had done before. And the other thing we wanted to know is how can this sensor detect these extremely low energy infrared photons, way out there in the infrared, uh, the far infrared part of the spectrum, very low energy per photon. And we had some ideas, and we worked through a number of those ideas, and every time we would try an experiment and go down an avenue, we'd find out, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Well, we finally hit on this idea of, and this was based upon another group of scientists' work, showing that the, uh, the, where they discovered the mechanism by which we sense heat, you know, and, and we can't do what these snakes do. If I close my eyes and hold my hand up, I don't know what you guys are even out there, but that snake certainly does. So anyway, we, we took the lead from those guys, and we looked into those pit organs, and we discovered these molecules that are called trip channels. They are the receptors for chemicals like capsaicin. Who knows what capsaicin is? The hot and hot peppers, right? Yeah. We have these capsaicin receptors, these trip channels in our taste buds that detect that hot in hot pepper. And it turns out that in our skin and in those pit organs, a similar kind of molecule is used to detect heat in us and these infrared photons in these snakes. Turns out there's a whole lot of these so-called trip channels that do many, many different things. That whole world is exploding. But anyway, this particular experiment is really cool because it did two things at the same time. One, it was the definitive proof that it is these trip channels, these capsaicin-type receptors that are the molecular sensor. And two, it proved the mechanism of information flow through the, the neural pathways in these snakes. What we did is anesthetize the snake <clears throat> carefully so that it was immobilized and, you know, and all that, but not uh, when its sensors weren't impaired. And we put it inside an MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging machine, actually a functional MRI. So MRI gives you a nice detailed image of what's going on inside. Functional MRI tells you literally what's happening on a millisecond to millisecond basis. You can watch changes happen inside a living animal in real time. And what we did was, expose the snake to uh, a heat source and watch what happens in the brain. And we were literally able to watch this region in the brain stem known as the LTTD. We, we could watch that region of the brain light up and immediately afterwards we see the optic tectum light up. So we were able to watch in a real live snake information flow through the brain. And then the second thing that we did during this experiment was we applied to the pit organ chemicals that we believe would interfere with the function of that trip channel, that thing that we believe was the molecular sensor. And it turns out when we knock out that protein, we knock out the ability of the brain to detect that information. So you kill it at the source. You turn off the ability to detect, and you don't see any changes in the brain. When you wash out that chemical and let it recover, let the cells recover, the sensor recover, the brain turns back on. So in one fell swoop, We've proven the molecule in a functional way, and we've proven the pathway of information flow. Really, really cool and exciting stuff, particularly for a kid who grew up reading about these holes in these snake spaces. It was such a, a great mystery, but, you know, of course, we knew everything we were ever going to know. Well, it turns out there's still plenty to be learned, and, and we still have a lot of work going on in this, in this uh, region of our lab. Anyway. I don't know why I stuck this one in here, but I, I always, I, I love to think about the beauty of light, the beauty of these animals, the beauty of science, all together in one thing, and, and it really comes together nicely in my life with these snakes. Um, but, 
We do more than just snakes. We also work underwater. We work on some interesting marine organisms, and this is part of you know, fate and this process of development and discovery. I landed here at Florida Tech, in a sense, out of happenstance. Um, I just happened to see an advertisement for a position that looked interesting, and they were willing to fly me down from a cold environment to sunny coast of Florida in February, and I said, sure, I'll take that, and I fell in love with the place. And because I moved here, I couldn't help but become a marine biologist because we're right here on the coast and it's a great place to do these sorts of things. So, two stories from the marine environment. One, anybody know what this animal is? A right whale. Oh my gosh, who said that? Oh, you're good. Wow. Nobody else has ever guessed before. That is a right whale. So, um, well, it's part of a right whale. This is his eye. Their eyes are pretty darn big, but they're really small given the size of the animal. Um, uh, uh, well, I'll show you another eye that is significantly bigger than this whale's eye. Anyway, so we were interested in uh, these whales, and uh, I won't give you, uh, it, it takes you long to give you a bunch of a backstory, but I'll just tell you that we're really interested in, we, we do laboratory <coughs> science, we do some field work, but mostly laboratory science, but we always try to think of the practical application of what we do. And in these whales, one of the most important practical applications is conservation. And it turns out that a, a, a tremendous threat to these animals, two, two tremendous threats, both human, are boat strikes and entanglement in lines. And it also turns out that this tends to happen in uh, nearshore waters, uh, waters that are heavily fished. Uh, it primarily tends to happen to females that are either about to give birth or with calves. They just happen to be in the areas where you know, a lot of ship traffic happens and where a lot of the long lines are placed in the ocean. So, we were interested in how these animals can detect ships, and how they can detect these lines, and how they can avoid them. We all know they have this sonar capability, but we don't do that. We do vision, so we thought, well, could we possibly have the opportunity to look at their eyes? It turns out it's very difficult to study whale eyes, as you might be able to imagine. It's very difficult to get whales in a lab. It's very difficult to get whale tissues in a lab. Well, we were perseverant, and we were able to get some right whale tissue, and we were able to get some bowhead tissue from uh, uh, Inuit hunts in, um, in the far north. So, this is a diagram of the retina. It's a diagram that's very similar among all vertebrate animals, as a matter of fact. Your eye, a whale's eye, a mouse's eye, your dog's eye. There are layers of cells within the retina. The ones that we primarily focus on in our lab are the photoreceptor cells. Um, I told you about the, the receptors of the, the pit organs, those heat sensors. Those are light sensors, photoreceptor. They detect photons of light. And they come in a variety of flavors, basically two forms, rods and cones. Rods operate under dim light conditions, and they don't detect color because we only have one type. Cones, on the other hand, operate in bright light conditions, and in most species, they are very good at detecting color. So, this is a series of curves. On the, the y-axis is absorbance, and on the x-axis is, um, I don't know if that spectrum is really correct here, it should be stretched out more to the right, somehow it got moved. But, but the short of it is, what we're trying to show you here is the, the array of different types of photoreceptors and their spectral absorbance and response profiles. The black dotted line is your rod cell. It, works best in the middle part of the spectrum, maybe in the green region, and then tails off on either side. And then you have three different types of cone cells. One that works better in the blue, one that works better in sort of green-yellow, and one that works best in the red area. And our brains interpret all this vast array of color simply by how much information input to the brain from these three distinct channels. So, you just integrate how much from the blue channel, how much from the red channel, how much from the green channel, and that tells you if something is red or chartreuse or, you know, magenta or whatever. So we have very good color vision. By the way, is anybody here colorblind? Nobody? Uh, so colorblindness is a mutation. In fact, there are many different forms, and what happens is a colorblind person is usually missing one of the molecules that makes these cells functional. So you're either missing the red sensor or the green sensor or the blue sensor or potentially two or rarely all three. Very, very rare. In fact, colorblindness itself, I think it's about 1% of the population. So it's pretty rare to be missing one. Anyway, that's us. 
Most animals have fewer than three. Our dogs and cats and horses and all those guys, they have two types of cone cells. So they see color, but they see like a colorblind person. They see color, but not nearly as well as we do. They can't discriminate this vast array of views that we do. So these whales, I don't know what I put in here. These whales, they started out behind the eight ball. They only have one. All cetaceans, as far as we know, have only one type of cone cell. So they don't detect color. They have a dim light cell type, rods. They have bright light cell type, cones. What's really interesting in these whales, and this is the very sad thing, is that it turns out that the northern right whale and the bowhead, and we believe all baleen whales, have a mutation that happened sometime back in their history that killed the one type of functional cone cell. So what that means is that we call them the, the, the world's only known vertebrate mono, rod monochromat. That means that they have only rod cells, nothing else. They only have one type of sensor. As far as we know, it's still like ours. It works very well in dim light, not very well in bright light. Definitely doesn't detect color. So what we like to, what we imagine right now is that <clears throat> these whales, first of all, are colorblind. Second of all, they're probably blind in bright light, which means they can't see a ship coming. You know, if the, if it's, hopefully their sonar is good enough. <clears throat> their sonar is not going to detect, detect these long lines. We believe that their eyes could, but they may not be able to detect them. They may swim right into them because they can't see. So, there is hope. What we're doing now is, is trying to begin a process to work with manufacturers and fishermen themselves to change the, the color of these lines. So, we're, we're, we're analyzing the cells that remain in their eyes so that we know what colors they can detect. They don't see color, but if we can have lines that have a color that makes a good contrast with the blue background light from the ocean world, then perhaps it will help these whales avoid entanglement. So, very different from this next story. One last one, and it's very different from this one. All right, who said that was the right way? What's this? Tarpa. Uh, ah, I got you. Tarpa. Very good. That is a tarpa. I told you about a big eye. Tarpon, an adult tarpon has an eye that's much bigger than a cow's eye. It's actually bigger than those bowhead whale eyes. It's amazing how big their eyes are. These are massive visually guided predators. They get six feet long, hundreds of pounds. They're one of the most sought after game fish on the planet. Um, we actually got into this because I had a graduate student who loved fishing and he liked tarpon. And I had him doing a term paper for a class, and he said, instead of a term paper, can I do some research? And of course, you know, we love those kind of students. So I said, sure, if you want to do some research, apply what you've learned in this course so far, you know, to your pet animal, pet, in quotes. And he loved tarpon, so, so he got us started on this, and now we've, we've developed a really nice research program on this. Um, and by the way, it really is a, a, another one of these hot button animals. I don't know if you guys recognize anybody in these photos, but look how small. That guy right there, same as this guy right here, it's Ernest Hemingway. He have been fishing down in South Florida, around the, the Keys. Um, huge tarpon fishermen. People literally come from all over the world to Florida. There's a, a billion dollar, I don't know what the actual number is, but it's huge. Fishing industry for tarpon and their relatives right here in Florida. So, we've been interested in how their eyes work and how vision develops over the course of their lives. And it turns out that their eyes change in very dramatic ways. These are just some photographs that illustrate the kind of work that we do, a lot of microscopy, a lot of biochemistry, to try to understand how the different cells operate in the eye. That's actually a, a, a larval tarpon. It's called a leptocephalus larvae, and they are bizarre. You would never in a million years know that it was a tarpon. They look like a, a glass clear ribbon with this tiny little head and these crazy fang-like teeth that point out the front. Really strange animal. So they change in form and function in a variety of ways, including their retinas. And the short of it is, <clears throat> we've done a lot of work on this and published a number of papers, but in some of their relatives, like the speckled worm eel, is the one we study most here in the lagoon, um, they're born with rod cells only, and they mature with rod cells only. They only have rods their whole life. These um, tarpon, on the other hand, they're also born with rods only, no cone cells. 
But as they begin to mature, they add some cone cells, and they're actually moving through some very different habitats, different light qualities over the light. They add some different types of cone cells, and they add more and more until by the time they're adults, they have five distinct types of cone. How many do we have? Three. We estimate, guesstimate, that your ability to discriminate color is about a hundredfold better for every additional cone cell you add. So that means these guys may be 10,000 times better than we are at discriminating color. And most of those photoreceptors are clustered down in the blue and even the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. So they're probably exquisitely good at detecting different shades of blue, which makes sense. They live in the blue world. And then there's a whole lot of other things that they add. They have a reflective layer called a tapetum in their eye. They add some movements. These cells actually start moving around over the course of the day. They'll change position from one time to the other to optimally collect light. All right, so that's sort of a, a little overview of the kind of things that we do in the lab, some of our recent discoveries. And it's really pretty exciting and pretty fun for a kid who grew up in a place like that. And I specifically chose that picture because to me that, still today, but certainly when I was, when I was a kid, this was my home. I, I just love being outdoors. The, the more remote, the more wild, the more uh, crazy, the better. Um, looking for animals, looking for interesting uh, features in the natural landscape. So just to tell you how this came about, I, I went to Georgia Tech. I wanted to stay in state for personal reasons. Um, my dad was ill. Um, so I looked around the state, I grew up in Georgia, and I chose not because of the programs they had, but I just said, oh, I think Georgia Tech's the best school in the state. So I went to Georgia Tech. Well, Georgia Tech had a program in applied biology which meant that I took courses not in, uh, to this day I haven't taken a course in ichthyology or herpetology or any of those other ologies. I took courses in um, recombinant DNA technology. Um, I took a course in industrial hygiene. This was a biology course. So it was a very different world. <coughs> Particularly for a kid who, you know, thought he'd be a forester or a farmer or, you know, maybe work with animals somehow outdoors. Very, very different sort of approach. I enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it. I took advantage of what I could. Um, when I graduated, I thought long and hard. I remember looking at all those flyers from the different schools and thinking, where am I going to go? What am I going to study? Well, I ended up staying in town by total happenstance. I, I, I went to Emory one day to medical school um, and discovered their neuroscience program in the, in the School of Medicine at Emory University of Atlanta and just fell in love with it. Um, but, you know, still, I wasn't quite where I wanted to be, um, but in my department, there was a guy who happened to work on African clawed frogs. They were just a good model system. I said, like, well, that's at least close to a reptile. I'm going to go see what he has to offer. And I ended up being a graduate student in his lab. Um, but the other thing that he did that I thought was really fascinating because I also happened, because of my interest in the outdoors, I love photography, he studied eyes. And I thought, wow, you know, he's got an amphibian, he's working eyes, as sort of the natural camera. So I ended up joining his lab, learned a lot of great stuff and cell biology and biochemistry and molecular biology. Again, things that I never thought I'd go into. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, I remember having a course in cell biology and we worked on, uh, this one section we worked on signal transduction, how signals get from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And I remember telling myself in that course, if there is one single thing on the face of this planet that I would never do. This is it. Well, it turns out, I guess in a sense, that's exactly what I do now. So, kind of funny. So anyway, when I left Emory, um, I actually had a little circuitous path there too. I also wound up at the University of Kansas Medical Center. But when I finally graduated, got my PhD, and it was time for the next step, I only just usually do postdocs at that stage. I looked around and tried to figure out where I'd go and what I'd do, and I said, oh, it's time to reinvent myself. I want to go somewhere and do, get back to real biology somehow. Well, um, I guess I sort of did. I ended up at the University of Virginia in a group called, it was the National Science Foundation Center for Biological Timing. And so we studied, uh, the group there studied biological rhythms, how animals time things, and guess what? It turns out that there are excellent clocks in our eyes. We got a clock in our brain, but we also have clocks in our eyes, and it turns out we have other 
photoreceptive systems scattered around the body. Not so much in us, but at least in non-mammalian vertebrates. There's a pineal organ, there's a parietal eye, there's some others. And so I was in hog heaven. Now I've got all these different eyes and like eyes that can show me cameras. I can study some really cool animals. So I was sort of easing my career path back in the direction that I wanted to go. Um, and ultimately, I ended up at Florida Tech. And by the way, this is how I normally dress every day, a tie and a coat, right? Um, I don't know what that thing is, but uh, anyway, um, that's my tie, actually. It's a living tie. So um, the bottom line is, now I'm here at Florida Tech. I've been here for 16 years. I've really had a blast. I love Florida Tech. It's been great to me. And over the course of time, I've risen through the ranks, the academic ranks. I've, I've become an administrator. I manage a, a microscopy center, really built it from the ground up. All these things I never in a million years thought I would do. So again, there's a real process of, of self-discovery. There's a lot out there that we just don't know. And anytime I meet students, we, we have a lot of high school students coming through and considering for a tech. And I always try to point out to them how, again, the world is your oyster. And, Trust me, the world is far, far bigger. There's so many more things than you ever could have imagined out there available to us. So, and it all comes around. Um, these are, I just tried to find a couple of pictures this afternoon to illustrate the fact that, you know, I, I, even though I'm in administration and I ended up doing all this molecular biology and biochemistry and microscopy, I still love the outdoors, I love animals. And as a product of this, <clears throat> just in very recent times, this photo at the top left, that is from a trek through the Amazon that uh, we made about a year or so ago. And this is, this is my son and myself. We're on the coast of one of the islands of the Galapagos. Um, and we're actually collecting data down there. So we have to have a lot of fun. <clears throat> I still function as a biologist, but in ways that I never would have imagined. So those are the kind of things that I wanted to to illustrate, and I guess, um, you know, if, if I were ever talking to your students, the, I think the two things that I think are most important are passion and perseverance. That, you know, we encourage kids to, to you know, always engage their passions. Find out what it is you really enjoy, and don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of, you know, I, I remember <laughs> when, when I was leaving home, for college, um, for Georgia Tech, <clears throat> my mom said, you're not going to take those snakes with you, are you? And I said, well, you want me to leave? She said, no, 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 take them with you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, when I get to come back now, and you know, I, you know, I can maybe hopefully impress her with the fact that I've done something productive out of that, you know, strange little passion I had as a kid. And it's, I think it's at least partly because of perseverance. Not only did I, you know, I somehow kind of stuck with what I was interested in, but as I illustrated, I took some very, uh, you know, large tangents over the course of time. But what I, in hindsight, none of this was planned, but in hindsight, I think what I got out of all of this was I picked up a lot of good things, a lot of interesting things, a lot of techniques, a lot of scientific knowledge, a lot of, uh, you know, contacts, friends, acquaintances, uh, mentors over the course of time, and I put them all into a package that I somehow, I guess, again through perseverance, just kept steering back in the direction that, you know, really satisfied the passions in me. So, so anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, I don't know what our time is like, but I have some, um, uh, well, there's a handout over there. And if there is time, if there's not, we won't. But if anybody would like to, there's a handout. And what I wanted to do was give you guys an activity if you've, You've probably done this before, I'm sure you have, but you ever, you know what your blind spot is? Does everybody know what a blind spot is? You ever talk about it with your kids? You know, so you can look at two dots on a piece of paper, close one eye, move this thing back and forth until that object disappears. And that illustrates the blind spot. So what is the blind spot? Anyway. Where the optic nerve connects? Yes, where the optic nerve is a collection of all the axons, all the fibers from the cells that transmit information to your brain. To your brain. It's where all those fibers come together at the center of the eye and exit the back of the eye. There are no photoreceptors there. They're all sort of squeezed out of the way. It's a really cool phenomenon. It's real simple, but it's a great simple tool to illustrate something cool about the organization of the retina. The other thing I put in there, though, was something that I like to call the night blind spot. Does anybody know what that is? That is your fovea. The fovea is that 
point on your retina, straight along the midline axis of your eye, where you have best vision, high acuity. If you look at a small point source of light, like a dim star tonight, go outside and do this, you've probably done it. If you look directly at it, it disappears. If you look off to the side, it reappears. And your eye wants to look directly at it, it disappears again. Why? The, your fovea is actually a collection of cones only. We're diurnal animals, we want those bright light cells, we want that color vision, and they're really tiny so you can pack them all in a small space and get better resolution. So, when you look directly at that star, that tiny point source of dim light is falling directly on your fovea, and your cones can't detect it. Your rods can, so when you look to the side, that light falls off the center of your eye, onto your rod cells, and I detect it. Anyway, really cool thing, and then the last thing in there, there's a little activity, it's a disc, you can mount, actually brought some stuff if you want to take something home and make this thing. You make a top and spin this thing, it's a, it's a pattern of black and white, when you spin it, colors appear. It's the coolest, it's not an optical illusion, it's not really an illusion, it's not you're seeing something, like you're seeing something that's not there, but it's, a, it's something about how your eye processes that moving image of black and white. Now, the reason I put that one in there, the other two things we can explain, that spinning disc, that appearance of color where there is no color, we have no idea why that works. No idea. So, if students need an example that, you know, we don't know at all, this is it. Neuroscientists the world over, we've known about this for more than 100 years. This, this, this top this, this was developed back in the late 1890s. To this day, we still don't know how it works. So, really, really cool stuff. There's a million more unanswered questions like that. So anyway, I'll leave it with that. Um, passion, perseverance, those are the watchwords. Thanks. Mm -hmm.